Hello, everybody. Welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. And Will Terry can't join us today. He is out on assignment. He's doing uh, he's doing the good work of teaching people how to illustrate in person. He's doing a, a workshop or something, so he couldn't join us today. But today we have Tony Cliff. Let me tell you a little bit about Tony Cliff. Um, he is a graphic novelist, a comic artist. He has six or seven or eight graphic novels to his name. The Delilah Dirk uh, graphic novel series is his creation. He's a flight alumni from the, the flight um, anthology days. That's how I got to know him uh, initially. Uh, he has had a past career in animation industry, uh, working on different animated series and and whatnot. And uh, you can find him at TonyCliff.com. I want to highlight his Patreon, which is patreon.com slash TonyCliff, where if you want to get comics and support comics, you can support him there. Got stuff like um, you're going to see how the book is is made. You're going to make, you're going to see like back, you know, behind the scenes stuff. You're going to have input on content in the book, stuff like that. So I would check out uh, his Patreon there. What'd you think of this interview, Lee? This was... He's, he's amazing. I mean, just first off, the guy's skill level is off the chart, in my opinion. I was telling Jake before we did mm-hmm. the interview that he's got this unique combination of being able to draw very detailed, but then also design and control it unbelievably well one of the best i mean just uh, he's a real kind of conductor of of his music i guess as an analogy he's really controlling each aspect of it and there's it there the images end up being really beautiful and yet Mm -hmm. he can tell any kind of story with a lot of stuff in there uh, but it never looks busy i mean normally i don't Mm -hmm. like it when the when scenes are filled with a lot of stuff i like them to like more simple images but i love this guy's work it's amazing yeah absolutely love it uh check out his comics that he's doing he made a children's book which is is pretty incredible it's um let's get sleepy with the cats <laughs> uh and if you're able to see this on youtube we're going to be screen sharing and and going over this uh you know going over all the, all his work and and lots of visuals here we do start off a little bit different from our normal interviews in that we hit him up with a question from one of our patrons um just right out of the gate. And that sort of set the tone for the rest of the, the episode. So without further ado, let's talk to Tony Cliff. Uh, okay, so we got Tony here and I figured we'd, we'd uh, start off a little different this time. And we sent Tony a question that we got from one of our uh, uh, Three Point Perspective patrons. And it's about comics. And, uh, and we figured who better to, uh, sort of crack this nut than, uh, than, than to just ask Tony Cliff since he's had so much experience in the comic world. You've had experience in the animation world, um, uh, somewhat. Right. And then, um, and so I think this, I think this works. So I'll read the, the question and then we'll, we'll break it down. So, uh, this comes from, uh, Brian Harold Taylor. And he says, hi, guys, I currently work a day job as an animator, but I'm not quite making it financially. Add to that, my goal has always been to write and illustrate my own kid lit books, ideally as a comic, as comics or graphic novels. I've been making them off and on since I was young. Car- comics aren't known for being very profitable, though. Since I now have a family, I need to make some kind of profit to financially justify the time it takes to make them. I've been building an online following to support my comic self-publishing efforts through Patreon. I also have an online shop. Over the last year, though, my social media growth has pretty much stagnated, as have my sales algorithm, I guess. At this point, I'm wondering if I should change course. I've been considering putting together a kid-lit graphic novel pitch for literary agents. Alternatively, maybe it's time to make a proper children's book portfolio, ditch comics entirely, and just focus on freelance. Just curious to hear your thoughts. And, uh, you know, if you're listening to this, you want to check out uh, Brian's work, check out uh, his Instagram account, Brian Harold Taylor. It's at Brian Harold Taylor and his website, BrianHaroldTaylor.com. He's he is quite talented, like, uh, or skilled. You know, he's, he, he, this is a guy who knows what he's doing. Um, but, I'm curious. What do you guys think? What do you, what what's the what's the answer here? 
<laughs> Whoa. Um, the first thing that stood out to me looking at this is I work is working as an animator, but not making it financially, which mm-hmm. contrasts very sharply with my own experience. So I um, I started off as an animator. Um, and worked in the Vancouver animation industry basically from 2004 through 2016, 2018, mm-hmm. somewhere around there. Um, and always, like, I always joked about it with my friends, like, you you ride the, well, I had one or two other friends who were making comics and working in animation. And, and we joked about the animation comics roller coaster where you build up your savings in animation and then you blow it all making comics and then you build it up <laughs> making working in animation and you blow it all in com- making comics again so to hear to hear that brian is um working in as, an, as an animator mm-hmm. but not uh but that that isn't bringing the dollars in that uh, that was a I'm, little red flag yeah. for me too well does that mean and, that he's actually not working in animation you're trying to be an animator is that a different? I mean, that sounds like what the difference is, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, these so these are all his, questions that none of us can answer, <laughs> right? But I mean, so, there's there's so, the red flag there for sure. Yeah, and from his about page, he um, he currently works out of his home studio in Eagle Mountain, Utah. So he's either freelance animating or he's working. You know, uh, he could be working for a studio from home or something like that. So I'd say the first. Uh, not to crack here. The th- first thing to tackle is maybe look at seeing how you can get more money animating. Because uh, there should be e- either um, uh, find a different job or find find better jobs. Because it is typically an industry that that does pay its artists fairly, um, even even though it is sometimes. Um, uh, there's a there's sort of like a dry spells, you know. Yeah. Uh, you'll you'll work on a project for a couple of years or, or a couple of months, and then they'll shut down the project, or they'll just need you know to um, uh, rearrange the the crew or whatever for whatever reason. Um, but but if you have a good animation portfolio, there's always seems like there's work out there. So that would be like the first thing I would look at. I just posted his uh, Instagram on. Uh, in our chat, if you guys okay. want to open it up, I'd love to hear what Tony thinks because sometimes I always, uh, you know, I there's a moment of hesitation when I read a question like this, and I'm like, are they really ready for these industries that they're trying to go into? And this person looks competent. Um, I'd mm-hmm. be curious to what Tony thinks or or you think, Jake. You guys have both worked in animation yeah. more than I have. I'll just um, share share the screen here. So if you're on good. our YouTube channel, you can watch you can watch this. I wonder what you guys would suggest that he include or ditch out of this is we're looking at his Instagram right now, but pretty solid. Looks like he's got a good drawing skill control over the line. Um, I don't know. Is there anything that's standing out to you guys about why this person wouldn't be wanted more? That's a good question. I mean, I was wondering, he says he works in animation. I'm wondering if he's animating, animating or doing design work Mm because his design sense is really strong. Right to yeah. me, uh, like all of his, all of the stuff he's posted is, you know, super appealing. You know, mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys talk talk a lot about uh, the sort of like invisible quality, not invisible quality, but like the intangible quality of appeal, right? Where it's uh, like, the X, you just look X at factor. The, yeah, yeah. Like this is these are really lovely looking drawings. Um, I can I like I can easily see him working a design job and and being successful at it. I would think. Um, yeah. So I think, so that, that's, you know, one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is, and I keep using cracking the nut, other side of the coin. I get, <laughs> I don't know how else to talk. Uh, the other <laughs> side of this though, is, is the comics kidlet route and looking a lot of times people get this grass is greener on the other side. You know, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of times animation, you, you know, creatively, your hands can be a little tied. You're, there's a much narrower window for you to be creative in because you essentially you are um, working to fulfill someone else's vision. And 
when you're doing a children's book, you're the sole illustrator. And so it's, it's a lot of your vision as if you're the, the author as well, it's a hundred percent your vision and the same with writing and, and drawing comics. So there is some fulfillment, a little more fulfillment that happens there, but is that a, is, which is a better route? Doing comics or doing children's books, <laughs> right? That's the question. Yeah, you've I, done I, both, Tony. You, well, you sent you sent and you sent me this question yesterday. Mm-hmm. So I've been thinking about it then. And one thing that I think about a lot, as well, um, in addition to those points you mentioned, is like the social aspect of it. Uh, mm-hmm. One of the things I really like about my time working in animation. Let me show put my pencil down stop rattling um <laughs> when I, like my time working in animation one of the things i really enjoyed is the people i met and the people i got to work with and going in every day you know when i'm working on storyboards getting to jam on stories with other really talented mm-hmm. really funny people um mm-hmm. when i'm working in animation just getting to spend time in that room and you know you show people stuff and you joke about stuff and you just like you're spending your you're spending eight hours of your day with a group of people whose sensibilities mm-hmm. you very often share, right? Right. Um, co- independent comics and, and illustration, you sort of lose that that experience, the studio experience, basically, right? Mm-hmm. You're on your own. You're you're at home. Um, and and I, I like. <laughs> So I've been working on comics mostly for the last several years, mm-hmm. um, and and I miss that that social aspect. But the flip side is what you already mentioned: is you get the benefit of getting to work on exactly what you want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, in mm-hmm. my experience, um, illustrating, working as an illustrator has been like illustrating somebody else's books, ideas, mm-hmm. right? has been sort of like the least satisfying of those options for me personally, because Mm -hmm. you don't get the benefit of looking at or or working on something that is your, is the thing that you want to contribute to the world is the thing you want to spend your, your, uh, your days and your hours, like, like putting out into the world. You don't get that. Mm -hmm. Um, But then you don't like in my case, um, you also don't get the, benefit of getting to be around other people mm-hmm. um and and getting to spend spend your days that way so i don't know it's, everybody's got to sort of figure that out for themselves like i a lot of people are perfectly happy to, to just, <laughs> just shut uh, shut the doors and send everybody else away right um right. totally i, totally I think get i that. think that is i mean that is like a really important point i think that's the reason that jake will and i started all this stuff is because we're sort of stuck in the studio by ourselves and this is sort of a way to be around people in a work kind of capacity as a freelancer. It's, it's tough. If you're social at all, I think this lifestyle is very tough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I, I, I too like really, so I worked in animation for, um, 12 years probably, uh, you know, one of those was sort of a video game studio, but we were doing uh, animated cutscenes, so I call it an animation studio. But um, and that was you're right. That was the thing that was really hard to let go was the the social aspect. Now um, Brian works works from home, so he's already sort of eliminated that. So I'm sure in, in his in his mind, it's like, well, I'm here working at home anyway, so I don't get those benefits of, um, of working in a studio, I might as well try my hand at some of these other things. And I think here's the, the main, my main problem with comics, and maybe you feel this way too, is there's this long runway before your comics plane takes off. And you're on that runway, gathering speed, gathering speed. And what I mean by is before it becomes like financially viable for you to pursue this. And some planes never take off and other planes, you know, just, just rock it. And I'm, I'm of the opinion these days that the comics, making comics, uh, is not a pursuit for the middle class. <laughs> it's, and by that, I mean, everybody I know who's, who's, uh, whose career is comics making is either very financially well off or poor. 
dirt poor, <laughs> <laughs> right? Or it's or it's a it's like they're funding that that um, that work through their animation savings or you know some other you know it's a, it's it's hobby time or something like that. So I don't know. Do you think that holds water? I mean, short answer. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, and as, as sort of a preface, I do want to say, like, you know, we can talk about, oh, you know, think about whether you really want to do a comic. You know, think about this aspect. Think about that aspect. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I can come out here and straight up tell your listeners, your viewers, like, don't make comics. Like, go right. do anything else. <laughs> right. Knowing confidently that mm-hmm. the people who <laughs> – there are going to be people who hear that and be like, don't tell me what to do. I'm going right. to do it anyway. <laughs> right. And, <laughs> like, I'm one of those people um, mm-hmm. where, where he's like, don't go into comics. Don't, it's, it's bad for this reason, bad for that reason. And I was like, nope, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it anyway. So you, you dear listener – Mm-hmm. Maybe one of those people. Um, if you are scared off, <laughs> if you are right. scared off by any of this, then that's okay. <laughs> right. You know, right. I'm, I mean, give it a try. Small pro- try a small project, that mm-hmm. sort of thing, um, to get into comics. See, see how it feels to you. But, um, mm-hmm. but yeah, like the the runway, man. I, when you talk about the runway, are you talking about like just the amount of time it takes to make one? Because comics take so long to make. <laughs> I th- and not just that, well, but then the the cycle of making the comic, um, publishing it, seeing if it's successful or not, and then if it isn't, starting that process over again on the next one to see if that one hits success, or if you're, you know, even if I look at like we'll we'll, we'll give two, uh, you know, completely unambiguous successes, Kazoo. And Reina, right? Okay. So, what did Kazu do before? And you he, only have to refer to them by their first name. You, you only do, right? <laughs> your audience, you know your audience reached, already knows exactly who you're talking about. You know you've reached a, a certain level of success if if it's first name only. So there's Hergé, there's Mobius, <laughs> there's right. Kazu, there's Reina. Uh, yeah, Madonna. <laughs> um, so, uh, Kazu, let's look at his runway. So, he... Uh, was working for, uh, you know, an animation studio, or it was more of like a a, a part time, not a part time, but a uh, independent sort of animation studio. Started the flights, flight comics uh, anthology. He was doing web comics, and none of this was like huge financial success. Flight, I think, for the most part, just kind of, um, uh, you know, kept the ship afloat. The, the flight ship afloat. I don't know if Kudzu was ge- earning a, a stable income from it at all, um, but it was enough to do Comic Con booths and to, you know, kind of keep that that engine going. Um, the web comic itself, the um, Daisy Cutter comic, all of those things were just kind of like trying to get, um, trying to get this comics thing going, and then the. Uh, Amulet series hits at Scholastic, and I know he got a really solid advance for that. And from our interview, I don't know if you remember Lee, our interview with Kazoo, but he said for the first like three books, it was still just barely making enough money to get going. And then after that, it started coming in and it was a huge success. And then we look at Reina. So so essentially there was, I would say, a 10-year period there where comics wasn't his primary primary uh, source of income. It was still doing other freelance work and getting things going there. Raina, on the ha- other hand, she was doing her webcomic, Smile, which Smile started out as a webcomic, and she was doing tabling at cons and really just doing sort of the same kind of thing, eking out a living trying to do it. And then that a smile book got a good advance and it immediately became a bestseller and it's just gone on to this magnificent career. But there was definitely this runway of years where it was trying to figure out the craft, trying to figure out the business of it and trying to find the voice. There were still like babysitters club books that she had to do before I believe like smile actually took off. Right. 
And it was good for her to do those babysitter club books because librarians could say, oh, this is the artist from babysitter, the babysitter's club graphic novels. And this is her like debut uh, self-authored, you know, uh, authored thing. So I look at, I look at that. If, if comics is going to be a substantial sort of path for you, right? I think there has to be this, you have to allow this window of experimentation and um, uh, essentially getting people familiar enough with who you are as a creator. And I can't think of anybody who just sat down, drew a comic for the first time, and bam, it was hugely successful. I, 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 unless you, I mean, I want to be proven wrong. And and again, I, I, I echo what you say and like, I don't want this to discourage anybody. And I feel like if somebody is really going to do this, they're going to do it regardless of what we say. But I kind of want to talk about the realities of it, right? No, of course. Um, and I, I mean, you talk about kazoo like making money off amulet it's apparently my understanding is that it's rare for books to even earn back their advance Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. the money that the publisher pays you up front you have to earn that for for the uninitiated um Mm -hmm. you as an author your sales have to earn back that amount uh, that they paid you at the start before they start mm-hmm. sending you royalty checks. And that's re- my understanding is that in general fiction, that's very mm-hmm. rare. In comic mm-hmm. books, it seems like um, it seems like maybe uh, <laughs> uh, maybe it's a little more a little easier or a little it happens more often um in the I'm direct sure. direct market. Like, like, I don't know. I'm thinking about strictly about like book market comics. Oh, okay. yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe my sample size is bad though, because because like, <laughs> like we're talking about we're also talking about you know flight people, um, mm-hmm. like you mm-hmm. and me and right. <laughs> you know like we're all just like farting Where around you, on the Lee? internet hanging uh, out with, fifteen uh, years ago when we were yeah. doing flight. I was I was right there. I I, I was hanging out with Kazoo. He, that's, he didn't like my work or something. <laughs> I'm never gonna forgive that guy for that. <laughs> Everybody, all my friends were doing it. Uh, uh, Katya and Chris Applehans and Kang. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally left out of the out of the fold. Look, he, sa- he <laughs> saved you from a lifetime of comics. It's, it's <laughs> like uh, so. <laughs> it's like that. You know the 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 curse, right? May you live in interesting times, type thing. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> it's like a double edged. Um, <laughs> So t- what's your, what's been your experience with Delilah Dirk? So you've, you've got multiple uh, volumes out now uh, of this, of this project. It's been like, this is a decade long project for you at this point, right? Maybe longer. So in the context of what you, we were just talking about, what mm-hmm. you were just describing the runway and, and the success and that sort of thing, it. Delilah Dirk has been, honestly, a sort of medium level success. Mm-hmm. Um, the first one got a really good response, um, and the second one got really good reviews, and the third one was the third one also came out. Um, the third mm-hmm. one happens to be my favorite, but uh, here we are. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and it. It is a it is a project I am doing because I love doing it more mm-hmm. than anything else. Mm-hmm. Um, it is it is not <laughs> <laughs> it's not making me rich right now. Um, <laughs> I I am very very fortunate in that uh, I live in Canada, so I don't have to worry about say I'm, I'm I live in Canada. I don't have any debt. Uh, I'm married uh-huh. to a wonderful partner, um, mm-hmm. and and I come from middle class a middle class background, right? Um, mm-hmm. In addition, in Canada, we have the option to apply for artistic uh, arts grants fund funding for projects like working on graphic novels and that sort of thing. Um, and so I apply every year. I apply every year. Uh-huh. Um, please, please, government of Canada, help support uh, these comic books. And I have been right. lucky enough to to win a few. 
Um, so between that and also um, the the property was optioned. Um, uh, the motion picture rights were picked up by. Um, oh. I have trouble remembering their name. It starts with a D. Um, okay. <laughs> down in, in California. So, mm-hmm. you know, like every, yeah. every two years I get a, I get a, uh, uh, <laughs> I want to, you know, it's hard to talk about these sorts of things, but like mm-hmm. that helps keep things afloat. So between one th- one right. source of like weird income and another weird source of income, um, mm-hmm. it's possible for me to keep doing these things. In addition, right. and of course I must absolutely include uh, the wonderful people who, who jumped on and have been supporting the Patreon uh, that I set mm-hmm. up for the most recent book, um, mm-hmm. including like... <sighs> Man, one of the other really nice things about comic books that nobody that I wasn't expecting when I got into it. When I went got into it, I was like, I've got this dream. And it's probably probably a similar feeling to the feeling I think Brian might have. Where you're just mm-hmm. like, I just want to publish my own book. Or I just mm-hmm. want my own work to be to take the form of a book. Right. And then I can say I'll, I've done it. Right. Um and then I can put it on my shelf and I can die happy. Mm-hmm. Um <laughs> You know, I had that feeling, uh, for, you know, for the for the first book, and you know, so again, that's also important context. It's like I'm talking to you, I'm 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 warning you away from comics, <laughs> or I'm I'm you know providing all this whatever. All my stories come from the position of someone who has been lucky enough to see mm-hmm. their 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 work published. To mm-hmm. you know, like I took. Um, when I worked on that first book, I, <laughs> well, I, well, I was buoyed by the confidence be- that mm-hmm. like the, the first thing I had ever published was my story in flight three, mm-hmm. which got nominated for a Will Eisner award. Yeah. Then I went down to San Diego. I took a little floppy comic, a 30 page, which end, ends up being the first chapter of the first Delilah Dirk book. I took that down there. Um, and that little floppy comic, which I published, <laughs> I printed, I don't know, 60 copies of or something, mm-hmm. um, got picked up by the right person. Mm-hmm. And it was also, so the second thing I've ever published was nominated for a Will Eisner Award. Wow. <laughs> and that, at that point, you're like, Maybe I'm good at this thing. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. I, for better or for worse, right? You're right. like, well, I mean, how can I, you know, it's, it's you know, just it's, like, it's more than what uh, other people who do comics absolutely. Uh, have, have gotten in order to do their comics. Right. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yes, it's, it's crazy. And, <laughs> so buoyed by that, um, it's it's the animation comics roller coaster. Like I took a bunch mm-hmm. of savings from animation, and I'm just like, I'm gonna take uh, a year and a half off, mm-hmm. um, because because I knew Kazu. I was like, Kazu, can you can you put me in touch with Judy, your agent, so we can mm-hmm. she can I can pick her brain about this sort of thing. And she was she basically gave me the advice. Oh, you're just gonna have to go do complete the book first before. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, even talking about getting it picked up by a publisher. And for other, additionally, it's probably also important to mention here um, that I don't think Kickstarter was a real, th- was much of a thing in 2010 or so. I mean, it was just barely, yeah. like, I think it was a year into it. And it was really oddball projects like, help me complete this Halloween uh, decoration for my um, uh, neighborhood type of stuff, you know? (laughs) The first comics project on there I saw was Jason Brubaker's um, Sithra or or something like that. I remember that too. Um, Yeah. So yeah, it wasn't- This is all all to say, like, I I took animation savings, took a a year and a half off um, and just hunkered down at my desk and combined- (laughs) Combined that first thing, another story, I did, Delilah Dirk story I did for Flight, mushed them together with um, some material in between, which I m- m- kind of had planned to do. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, so and and 
well, I, you know, there was the first book, right? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, then, then I start off on the, on the, the whole, you know, publishing journey and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, Kickstarter hadn't, nobody was really, really talking about Kickstarter in terms of comics, like really, really serious. Or we hadn't seen how mm-hmm. powerful it could be, right? You hadn't right. done yours yet. Yours was one of, Jake, yours was uh, your first Kickstarter. I remember, <laughs> <laughs> I remember, I vividly remember seeing a video, I think, of the truck showing up at your house. Did you post something mm-hmm. like this? Yeah. Yeah. And and like just looking at those pallets of books and boxes <laughs> and thinking, oh, right. Okay. So traditional publishing for me then. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't want to deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I keep doing it though. I, I keep doing it. I, I I got that bug. I love it. So whatever. And and I might ha- I might have to come around back to uh back to that at, at the mm-hmm. end here but um um uh, but so one of the things i didn't expect you know chasing all these comic dreams was the people it would put me in touch with like mm-hmm. the people i would meet through flight mm-hmm. and the readers um who would come in and like i set up <laughs> i set up the patreon and there was one guy who 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 i had seen um, from you know, like social media, maybe uh, other places, who popped in there before I even told anybody that I had a Patreon sort mm-hmm. of thing. Like you just you meet people like that who who are just so so supportive beyond your wildest dreams. Mm-hmm. It, um, I don't know. It's it's like one. <sighs> If it really feels like one thing for a publisher to say, yes, we would like to print your book, and a total other thing for another civilian to come along and say, mm-hmm. I really like your drawings and stuff, and you know, here's here's ten bucks a month to to keep working on that book that you're working. I'm sure it'll probably right. be good, and and it'll almost certainly come out, right? Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so you got uh, the book, first book deal. It was with First Second, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you've been doing, how, how many books have you done with them since then? So there was, uh, yeah, so DD1 came out in 2013. DD2 came out in 2016. And then DD3 came out in 2018. And then at the end, at the when I handed in DD3 in like summer of 2017, I had spent the time working on that. The time working on that book was, I was, I was scrambling to hit the deadline. Mm-hmm. And I found the whole experience, you know, long story short, the whole, whole experience to be very difficult difficult but not very challenging right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like it's just gotta get pages done gotta get pages done. and i ended up feeling like really burnt out on the whole comics making process Uh, i was like all right time for time for something different um so took some time to work on a kid's book Let's Get mm-hmm. Sleepy, which came out during the pandemic. Just beautiful. In I love it. <laughs> it was kind of you to say. Um, yeah. uh, find, all, <laughs> find all the little cats. Right. Um, Let's get sleepy. <laughs> right? Um, it's, which was motivated entirely because I had seen Vera Brosgol, I think, mm-hmm. read... Um, Leave, Leave me, alone. me alone. Yeah. Read her kids' book. Leave me alone at a at an event, and I loved seeing all the kids screaming, <laughs> "Leave me alone!" <laughs> like that's <laughs> another fun thing that would be fun <laughs> for kids to scream out while you're while you're at a reading. Now, I, who could have anticipated that it would come out during the pandemic when we'd be doing mm-hmm. no reading, <laughs> right? <laughs> to you know, in groups, <laughs> yeah, in real life. Um. <laughs> so let's get sleepy came out in 2020 and then um <laughs> i got i got an email from calista she's like hey do you want to do you want to would you be interested in calista my editor at first second saying mm-hmm. do you want to draw 
um, a graphic novel version of the podcast Bubble. Um, <laughs> and Bubble Bubble is a, a comedy science fiction um, podcast, like fiction serialized podcast put out by the Max Fun, Max Fun Org, uh, written by Jordan Morris of Jordan Jesse Go. I, was mm-hmm. like, I had listened to it and loved it. And I was, <laughs> I was like, yes, very much so. Yes, that will be a fun change of pace. It's extremely not for kids. Uh-huh. Um, it's extremely not for middle grade readers. Um <laughs> And yeah, so we had a blast working on that. Um, and then I got to. How did this turn into Tony's life story moment? Um, well, we no, we, it's good. We brought you on the podcast for a reason. You so. know, that's fine. yeah. Um, <laughs> and then, God, that project was so much fun to work on because it it gave me, or I got to, <laughs> I got to steal a little bit of that thing that I liked from from animation which is mm-hmm. where you got to like sit around and shoot the <laughs> and you know mm-hmm. run your mouths spitball right. ideas that sort of right. thing like i mean we weren't doing it in person which was kind of a bummer but um you know we had google doc sheets with uh google docs with different versions of different jokes and like what's um you know like what's the funniest thing for annie to say here and mm-hmm. you know like comments on the thing and it was it was so much that's fun great. and it was so much fun to draw just something that's just it's it's silly but it's also got it also had like a really really nice heart so it was like so after after feeling a little burnt out from dd3 this one brought me back feeling like oh okay yeah let's uh <laughs> Like, oh, yes. you, you can get this back is, to this again <laughs> yeah and the, and and honest honestly like you know like if you're trying to tell me if you're trying to scare me away from comics like i just can't <laughs> comics i can't quit you <laughs> no you can't <laughs> um if you've got this sickness you know yeah you know. um so what's the really quick note about bubble was was it is it a black and white book no, but okay. So you got order, a colorist for it, or yes, and okay, uh, that was I think uh, a timing issue. Like, yeah, like we were we were trying to get it done. I think, or at least <laughs> <laughs> I, I I can't speak to for a second's motivation towards it. But but my 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 thinking on it was, guys, if if I am also coloring this, it's gonna take twice as long to come out mm-hmm. and so it was just i think a matter of timing let's get let's have yeah. somebody else color and natalie reese did a beautiful job mm-hmm. there, th- there are some things in there that she uh does with color like some some false color two color panels that i've been trying to replicate myself and i can't figure out how she gets it to work i when mm-hmm. i do it i feel like it's, it's not working but she does it and it and it, it looks it looks right i don't know <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, and then um, that so that came out twenty twenty one, I think. Okay. And um, so this this last Delilah Dirk book is that uh, going to be a first second book, or are you is uh, have you not made that deal yet? So that's so that's the tricky thing is, mm-hmm. and this this is where this is where it gets weird. Um, so I handed in Bubble, had a great experience with Bubble, um, and I knew I wanted to do this fourth Delilah Dirk project. Mm-hmm. This was another one of those scenarios where, like, I just got to do this book before I die. Right. Um, <laughs> and, and then there we go. We're good. Um, but we were also, at the same time, expecting our first child. We, um, and one of the, one of the things I was really conscious of is, well, there are a couple of things to balance here. Like I was really conscious of the fact that you read those stories about people who are on their deathbed saying, (laughs) basically all agreeing, I wish I hadn't spent so much time working. I wish I'd spent more time with my children. Right. (laughs) And which, which is always, always sort of like top of my mind there so so i'm like how do okay so how do i not so first of all sorry i'm getting i'm getting really muddled on this so we have that (laughs) so we have a a child entering our lives and i do want to spend time with him Mm -hmm. or her at that time um and i was also so that's going to take 
time away from other things. And if I take an advance from a publisher, this comic book project is going to take, um, if every previous comic had taken about 18 months to, mm-hmm. to two years to do, which is really fast considering <laughs> what goes into how, it. How much but work, also, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but also realistically from like a, on a human scale, it's a long time, right? Mm-hmm. You know, high school was only five years. <laughs> long. <Right. laughs> um, and I'm looking at this, at, at um, our, our new situation, starting a family. Our, um, so if I estimate that I'll have half the amount of time to work on comics as I normally would, mm-hmm. um, then what does that mean? Is this comic book going to take four years to make? So if I took if I took a really, really healthy advance from a publisher, let's say it for easy math, let's say it was $40,000. Mm-hmm. Um these days, publishers are paying in four installments. Mm-hmm. It seems like on signing, on delivery, um, it's ridiculous, right? Yeah, uh, delivery, on delivery, publishing, on... and a year after publishing, or something, right? Something like that. When we talked to an agent about that, um, uh, like six months ago, and she was just like, "Yeah, it's my life's purpose to like get my uh, clients." out of that situation where they can get as much money upon signing as possible because they're just trying to hedge, you know, completely and at the expense of their creators. And I'm, I'm coming from my, my animation background where I'm thinking I would, I need production funds, right? I like, I need something to sustain the, (laughs) to keep, you know, the lights on. Right. For as long (laughs) as it takes to make this like, crazy ambitious project sort can of i think. take a side note just yeah. with this and the thing i've been thinking about is the one of the inherent problems with that with a low advances and spreading out that money is the type of person that can now create a graphic novel is either someone who's financially um solvent like they don't they don't need that money to, to survive or they are in a situation where they don't need to provide for anybody and they can just live a very scrappy existence mm-hmm. and get by on that. And so you essentially are getting stories from a very fringe group of people, you know, people who uh, who I don't think represent the entire spectrum of stories that need to be told out there. And so... Uh, what what you I think what you see is it just it it harms the kind of books that we're getting. You know? Sure, yeah, and I think there was an article in the Guardian, which <laughs> uh, a few years ago maybe, uh, written by some written by a writer saying basically in order to write novels you have to be rich. <laughs> and and I think about I the the other side of that being. I've heard so much that <clears throat> that publishers are looking for underrepresented voices. Right. And exactly. That is, yes, that would be lovely to see on bookshelves. But I, I not but, I just worry, like, are, <laughs> does this mean, you know, some disadvantaged, disadvantaged aspiring comics person is coming in and is making a deal that right it's just is as not gonna <laughs> you know not gonna like get i want to hear or i want to read or like you know <laughs> yeah i want to read that comic that's by a single mom you know who's who's raising a kid <laughs> and her life experience funneled into a fantasy story you know whereas right now you know you you i don't think you're getting that because a single mom doesn't cannot afford to do comics, even sure. as much as yeah. she wants to. Yeah. Um, but anyways, I, that was just a side note on you uh, going. You know, what do you do with this? You've got a kid. You've got Delilah Dirk, which could now take four years to do yeah. instead of <laughs> the two years. How do you get by on? an advance that's paid out in four installments, essentially $10,000 spread out over four years. How do you make a book with that? Right. 
Yes. Uh, it, and <clears throat> uh, I think one thing that cannot be repeated often enough is uh, you'll hear uh, people talk about authors getting, you know, six figure advances and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but the, you know, the reality of how that breaks down is, is that it, it can get you by, but it, it's, yeah, it's not it as much money as it doesn't as it mean sounds what like. you think it means when you hear <laughs> six figures. Right. right. Um, I was listening to your guys' episode, the last episode you posted as of as we're talking today about about mm -hmm. self publishing. Um, and one of the things, one of the things that jumped to mind as you were talking about kind of a kind of a publishing horror story was like, I just thought, I just thought, oh, did these guys have a have an agent? And I, <clears throat> so when we talk about advances, mm -hmm. um, one of you. I I am happy to pay a portion of that to my agent because I right. really like my agent. <laughs> right. Um and one of one of the things I will say um that, that is I she's fantastic. We got in this I was told once that the only measure of how good an agent is is how much money they can make for you. Mhm. Mm um, I discovered in real life that they are, and I'm not going to go into specifics. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. If you find yourself in an awkward, strange contractual situation, a good agent can get you out of it. Right. Um, <laughs> and you know, you right. talked about in that other pod, other episode, you, Jake, you were talking about, you know, opportunity cost. Um, like I, I just got found myself in a situation where a whole, <laughs> I basically, I was contractually obliged. I, I signed up to, to work on one project and over the course of several years of waiting, it mm -hmm. turned into a different project mm -hmm. such that, such that by the time they got a, back around to me, like this wasn't the project that I signed up for. Right. Right. Which became... Which which became the point when I was very glad to have somebody um, wise about contracts arguing on my mm -hmm. behalf. Mm -hmm. And yeah, your agent is good at that because um, she's my agent, right? Like so. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, sorry. I didn't know that you guys uh, have no, the same no, no, no. agent. Uh, sorry, Jake, are you with Judy? Yeah. Uh, no, I'm with Bernadette Baker Bachman. Oh, okay. Were you Sorry. with Judy at at one point? No, no, no. I did mention Judy because I had oh, okay, talked okay. to Judy. Mm -hmm. Um, but no, no, no. I well, no, Judy's I'm another good agent for that. For that, <laughs> she's she has a lot a legal background. She used to work in a legal department, so she she knows she's. If you ever spend any time with a lawyer, their whole life is about what could possibly go wrong and how do you mitigate that. <laughs> Yeah. Have you have you talked about Judy much on here, Jake? <laughs> What's that? Have you talked about Judy much on the podcast? Uh, no. When it, when we do when agents come up, I'll mm. just mention my experiences yeah, and whatnot. She, so. she is infamous in, in right. comics. <laughs> um, um, so so here's the I guess here's the the question. Um, I, Today, your experience is, has, you know, is a, is a 10 year plus long experience in comics. But today, for someone who's, who's rolling up, whether they're in their 40s or in their 20s and they're wanting to, to do comics, what, what would be your like, like straight up advice? Like, you know, we've, we've said all the perils, you know, the dangers that go into this. But regardless of those, what would be your um, just point blank advice on on how to go about like charting that course, getting mm. getting through that runway? That's so tricky because there's just you can't. I am so loath to tell anybody you should do this or you should do that mm -hmm. or you should do this, because even since we started this. Mm -hmm. you, uh, <laughs> Even since, you know, flight comics days, everything has changed so much. There is nothing mm -hmm. about my experience specifically that I could say to anybody. Um, do what I did, right? <laughs> yeah, do what I did. I, the only things <coughs> that I think definitely hold true are 
I think there's great value in starting small mm -hmm. um, and finishing a small thing. Get a small thing finished before yes. trying to to get out there and and you know absolutely crush a ten thousand page project. Um, just get something small so you know every aspect of the process. Like even, even if, do mm -hmm. a five page story. Mm -hmm. See how you like that. <laughs> yeah, write it, draw it, color it, do all of it um, because. Also, you know, when you're done, you, congratulations. You're not an aspiring author anymore. You are, are an author. Yeah. You, you, did a, you made the thing. Mm -hmm. um, that holds true. I, I think think about how you want to spend your hours. When I was in my 20s and I was working in animation, obviously, I, like I just wanted to work at Pixar. Or I wanted to work at Disney or I wanted mm -hmm. to work on on these, you know, with passion pictures, making those cool music videos and commercials yeah. and stuff. Cause they were amazing. They were pushing the boundaries, that sort of thing. Um, and then, then a thing happened as I spent more time working and I spent more time in the industry. Re I'm realizing like I'm spending, you know, 40, 50 hours a week in the studio. Like this is my life. Right. <laughs> that I'm living. How you spend your days is how you spend your life, right? Like exactly. <laughs> and 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 I found that you know, like, like I described before, like the the value of being in a room with people you like. Um, you know, maybe I'm working on. I don't know. Maybe I'm working on some you know one series uh, animated. Um, thing you know, it's never going to go past one series. It's just this, yeah. you know, the voice acting's poor or something. But I get to spend every day in a room. Man, I can think of one show which was exactly this. It was such a bad show, but <laughs> I got to go. I looked. I was so excited to go in every day because I was spending the room, my time every day in a room with three other guys who were just a blast to be around. Right. I'm like didn't matter what you were working on. Cause yeah. You're busting up all day long, right? <laughs> yeah, it was it was just such a lovely thing. So you know, I I encourage people to maybe think about that, give that some thought, um, and then I don't man, I don't know. Like if if you're gonna do it, you're, you're probably just gonna do it. Mm -hmm. My um, my thinking on this is, and and this is my. Th path moving forward is what I'm thinking now is why not try everything? So I've, I've done the Kickstarters. I've done the publishing through uh, Scholastic with Missile Mouse. Um, I've done some just posting on my own shop, like no Kickstarter, just here's a book that I paid to get printed. You can now buy it. I've done PDF downloads, right? I haven't I've dabbled a little bit with like webtoons where I've uploaded a comic there just to see what the experience was like. Um, the only thing I really have, I've, I've done direct market comics, not my own stuff, but I've done like Rocket Raccoon. I did several issues of that. So I've done a little bit of all this and I'm like, okay, so moving forward, why not try to get that book deal from the publisher? Try to, and, 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 and do that one thing, do the Kickstarter. Uh, this, is also after I've figured out a very streamlined, fast approach to making comics. So <laughs> um, a page can take me, you know, uh, layouts to inks four hours, right? And unless it's on average. So there's shorter ones, there's longer ones. But I, you know, the last 50 pages of comics I've drawn, it's averaged out to that, right? So that's not a huge time ask. Um, as opposed to when I first started where it was like 13 hours a page and I was getting in there with my tiny little pens and trying to do all the detail. I've settled on a style that, that, that does that. So with that in mind, why not launch a Kickstarter? Why not uh, have the funding from a Kickstarter? Because I'm at that stage now where I, I can pretty much know a window of amount of money I'm going to get from that Kickstarter. That can also fund some of the production down the line for this you know for this next project which could be in advance why not try pitch to uh like an image comics or something like that do a mini series so you're not on the hook for 
200 pages, but 125 pages, right? And just kind of throw everything at the wall and see which one of these paths kind of kind of work and look at it more as like a, a five-year project instead of a, what do I got to get done this year type of thing. That's kind of where my head is right now. Yeah. And I, I mean, a lot of people will probably end up doing that anyway. Mm-hmm. I mean, just just like trying. <laughs> yes. I mean, yeah, just trying one thing, feeling, feeling like mm, it didn't quite work out for me. Like I did the thing I did in, in 2012, did the thing you were saying about, you know, set up your own web shop, mm-hmm. uh, take mail orders, mail out the, the comic books. And I, I I think it was reasonably successful, but but mm-hmm. it was just not the type of work I wanted to be doing, <laughs> like just mm-hmm. doing all the mailing and right and managing that sort of thing. Cause it just meant so many trips to the post office. Right. Um, and I'm conscious of, I'm conscious of our, our time that we have here. I want to, I do, <laughs> do want to think of you guys whole day, but you, you mentioned like working on a fast process and I, or discovering a fast process for making comics. And man, that is such a, that is such a challenge in comics is, Mm -hmm. is that, that tension between wanting to create something artistic with artistic integrity that, that you are proud of and which Mm -hmm. you feel challenges your skills versus like knowing I'm here to tell a story Mm-hmm. the number one, the, the most important aspect of this comic is the story. Cause we've all had the experience where you pick up a really beautiful book, but mm-hmm. the story, but the story, the story is lacking. And so the art kind of fades a little bit. Right. Um, versus and you can, I, my, you can pick up a book that's like not really your look. Right. But right. if the story grabs you, you're like, I love this artwork now. That's my experience at least. I don't know. Yeah. Sorry. And I, I'm you? recently reading, um, just some shonen trash. It's Kaiju number eight. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I love it. Cause it's, it's these kids in in these special kaiju suits that fight kaiju right and so oh, i'm gonna have to get that door but let me just finish this this thought as i'm reading through it i'm like this art is so i could tell it's done so fast like oh my gosh hmm. these guys had a two-day deadline I, <laughs> they just had to get this story out and i don't care because i'm reading through it so fast because i want to find out what happens next and i'm and like i know all the guns in there there's like all these like they are essentially using like clip art <laughs> put, putting them in there like i'm like that's the same gun five times on this page you know <laughs> And, and it works. They, you know, there's some artistry to it, but I'm like, oh my gosh, am I being way too precious with my art? If mm-hmm. this is being successful and I, and I don't care about it, it's just one thing I got to think of. I'm sorry. I got to go get that door. Lee, you take over. I'll be right back. Oh, let, let me, me- well, during this brief Jake intermission, I will mention another mm-hmm. point that I was sort of thinking of when you guys were talking about in the self-publishing thing, thinking mm-hmm. about your, your market and that sort of thing. Right. I think for for these days for an aspiring comics person um definitely you mentioned thinking about your audience very early on you know um there's an aspect to that where it's like if you are making a young readers comic book then traditional publishing feels much more viable than if you want to make um x-rated pornography comics <clears throat> right i can imagine um, <laughs> um i was man i was looking <laughs> i followed some links to to one particular web comic which was very explicit i was like clicking around so i clicked through the artist patreon and they're making twenty thousand dollars canadian per month of course of course they are um which like can you but can you <laughs> It makes me think back to like if you were trying to make do the sim- a similar thing in the '90s or the '80s or that sort of thing. What would your options be? I mean, you certainly there wouldn't would be, be no making, options. Yeah, you it certainly would be, wouldn't be making twenty thousand dollars a month, right? No, um, no, it's the heyday. I mean, like we were talking about the other day uh, in that 
self-publishing a, a podcast so that, you know, pick a niche and get rich, you know, like that sort of what they did. They, they drew their line in the sand maybe, and they get their, you know, small, weird audience from all over the world though. And then all of a sudden the Patreon's funded in a certain way. Um, I did want to make a point, just go back to something that you said that I think is really interesting. Um, especially talking about comics in these longer kind of projects. I noticed, I, I, so I taught a senior portfolio class for a number of years and I, it never would fail the first week or second week when I would interview each student and we sort of talk about what they're going to do. And every time, or many of the times, they would, I would, would start to come up with their plan and I'd say, okay, what do you want to do when you graduate in, you know, 11 weeks or whatever? And they'd say, oh, I want to make a, I want to be a, make feature films. I want to <laughs> own my own <laughs> Game studio. Yeah, and, AAA and it, game. <laughs> it, 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 even despite saying, oh, I just want to put the exclamation point on something you said, which is start small and make something really good versus going for this giant thing. I'd be like, okay, maybe you're going to, maybe you'll own a film studio in, in 20 years. That's not going to happen in 11 weeks when you graduate. So why don't you make a, a, a minute or two minute long short which is actually possible to show what you want to do or something like that. I just, I just wanted yeah. to put that, drive that point home because so many people it just keep hearing it over and over make too complicated of a thing. It doesn't even have to be good. It just has to be finished. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> the, the point is, the point being like, <clears throat> you need to learn the, ex you, artist, need to learn the experience of finishing a thing. You may be very good yeah. at drawing. You may be very good at setting things up, but but please practice the skill of finishing a thing. That's hard, right? Um, right, because finishing it, you that's when the real important decisions get made. Like this thing could go on forever trying to perfect it, but if you know you set you give yourself a deadline, arbitrary or not, uh, you know you're going to have to stop it at some point. And I, there's a Steven Spielberg quote. He's like, no movie is ever finished. They're just released. <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense. And I, th I think there's a certain safety in things being in process. And so I agree with you that, that the idea of saying, hey, this is a finished thing and you can yeah. buy it here or you can see it here is important because you can always, that's why people love sketching so much and just doing little characters that don't mean anything because either people like it or don't like it, but it's always like, oh, it's just a sketch. It's just a sketch. They never have to put their stamp on it and say, hey, this is what I got. This is the best I can do right now. It's been three hours on this today, but it's a doodle. <laughs> There's a discount there that I, that I don't like. I agree with, you know, when I was in school, we, we had this uh, uh, scholarship contest every every term and it was always like the term right or the week right before the semester would end so you, everybody knows it's coming and there was a certain kind of i don't know it was a, a certain kind of energy to putting it on the wall because that's all you, you can't just stand there and say this isn't done and this isn't done you put it up on the wall and that's the best as you got and that's what's going to yeah, be judged yeah. and it always felt really good to finish it even if the work wasn't great or wasn't perfect to put that stuff up on the wall because it kind of was a finish line for that group of work. And then the next, then, you know, you move on to the next thing. And, but I don't think without saying, Hey, this is finished and it's up and it's judged. Uh, if I would have had that feeling, if it would have always been just kind of a work in progress, I guess. Yeah. Nodding, nodding yeah. vigorously. That's a, that's a <laughs> core tenet of mine is, is you got to finish, you got to finish it. Um, okay. So, did did we did we solve the comics problem the comics conundrum today? <laughs> I don't know. I, it's a tricky Lee, one. It's, yeah, it's so and tricky. It is. Oh, you I know what? You know what else is worth mentioning to to somebody who's new to it? We we've all we all grew yeah. up reading like Marvel comics or DC comics or something, and that whole process of you know ink penciling, inking, coloring lettering it's all broken up into those stages to suit mm. the monthly comics industry i'm just thinking like like sorry with with the uh, with dd4 it's the first project where i'm trying inking uh mm -hmm. all my previous books i just did like really clean uh, pencil drawings and i'm doing this inking i'm like oh the only reason they did this is because it photographs better than like it was just a technical limitation. Anyway, this mm -hmm. is all I get around to say to like you're starting out right now. Like, 
if you read a book that's telling you about the penciling process and the inking process, like, whatever, just crack open Procreate or like just do make something in collage or, you know, like found objects or something or get your charcoal going or something. Like, like, our technology is so much better now. It, and if you're doing it all yourself, why restrict yourself to... A good point uh, to this to this one like production pipeline that was mm-hmm. designed for a very specific reason and has created a very specific look that that means a lot to us that is sort of like embedded in our in our blood a little bit but right. you don't you don't need to limit yourself to that new artist you like go that's so funny to hear because if somebody here doesn't do comic i don't do comics but i i think to myself just internally if I'm going to do comics, I got to, I got to get better at inking. Mm. Like all of a sudden I got to get out the old pen, even though I don't use that at all in no my way. process. <laughs> if yeah. you did a, Lee, if you did a comic in your style, that would, uh, that would be really cool. That'd be, I would, I would love you, that. You know what, you know what stops me from doing it? Mm. it I, I, so I'm working this on conversation we had today. Children's book. <laughs> yes. It's terrifying. Um, the, <laughs> Doing a children's book, you know, there's there's your there's your cell images that are the images that are what the book is really about, and you really get yeah. into making those. They're high drama and, and 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 artistic. And then there's these other images that just I need to move the story forward. And I'm working on one of those today, actually, right now. <laughs> and and it's just not going to be uh, that interesting of an image. I want to make it as interesting as I can, but it's like pulling teeth to me to get to those images that are the big cell images. And comics have seemed like they have so many where it's two people sort of talking or or mm-hmm. you know all it's just so much moving of the story and then every now and again you get these like nice images you know plus i'm lazy so i could never do it i mean <laughs> the, 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 the amount of panels that you guys do is is insane to me um it's just not how i think i just think it's a lot slower and with a lot fewer kind of images so the children's book realm for me is like the sweet spot, 32 pages, <laughs> breaks down to about, you know, I got a bunch of full spreads in there too. So, uh, so those are, you know, if there's only 16 pages, depending on how many are full spreads, that's about, about enough for me. <laughs> yeah. But, there's, there's, there's a thing. I get that. I, and I, that's a, that's a definitely a talent to be able to distill something down to like really iconic imagery is such a good skill such as a skill i'm jealous of because the thing that i like like i love animating i love literally animating not like specifically animating the one where you draw one drawing then another drawing then another drawing and you see something come to life and comics do that a little bit too from like panel to mm-hmm. panel to panel like it it does feel a little bit like something is coming to life and that's one of that like that's one of the reasons like i can't I can't quit comics. That's interesting. That's a nice, that's a nice thing because I think you get to know your characters a lot more than I do in my work. I mean, yeah. It, well, it's like, it's just one way of, of approach of creating something that's meaningful or read for a reader. Right. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I don't know. All right. Awesome. Do we want to cut it off there? Sure. Let's wrap it up. It's been about a, about an hour. Yeah, a little over I, an hour. I, I do. So just we try last, to limit them to about an hour. Yeah, I just want to go back to Brian. We started with him. I want to finish with him, and just kind of give some succinct advice. I would say number one, Brian, um, try to get some better paying work in animation. That'd be that'd be my first focus for you. Um, you've got the portfolio, so I'd hit up a light box next year with your portfolio. And and meet with the actual animation studios, meet with the recruiters, and see about getting some some better better paying work. Because I don't know that I, I think I don't know that he's actually working in the LA animation scene. And right now is a good time for people who don't live in LA to be able to get work there mm-hmm. because nobody's working in the studio. So that'd be number one. Number two, if comics is truly your your passion keep doing the Patreon comic thing and just put it out consistently at the rate that you can do it comfortably. Like, like, so you don't kill yourself, but that you're still consistent. And, um, and I would say, like Tony was saying, finish something, 
Okay. And, and maybe, you know, your, your, your idea is a 200 page graphic novel. Just start with, here's my first short story. It's 20 pages, download the PDF here or post it on webtoons or something just so that you can get some, um, uh, notoriety or, or, or people to understand that you are a comic creator and, and that you deliver consistently. And then I would just do that. Just plan a schedule to do the comics thing, release something like that every two months, six months, whatever you can, can do. Um, and then once you have 200 pages of comics, then your options, I think, in comics uh, uh, really explode. Because now you can do a Kickstarter, no problem. You can get an agent and say, hey, look, I've got this 200-page graphic novel here. You know, you can <clears throat> see if there's a publisher interested in it. You could go, t- you know, contact... Boom Studios or Image Comics or Skybound or something like that and just say, look, here's what I do. And uh, and then you could go that route or you can just continue to, to go on the route you're doing. Can you what imagine do you telling that to an illustrator? Hey, just do 200 illustrations and then things will really start to pick up for you. It's like the equivalent of the the people who are like, who are like this video game is okay. Things really start to pick up after the 40th hour. Right. <laughs> It's, but it's true. I mean, uh, I was listening to a YouTuber who's, who's a filmmaker. He's one of my favorite YouTubers, Patrick Willems. He makes, uh, uh, he's a, he's like an indie filmmaker who makes video or, or film commentary videos. And I love his stuff. But in one of his, um, one of his Q and A sessions that I was, I was watching, he very succinctly put it. He said, People only hire you to do what you've already done. And so he's like, if I want to make a feature film, then I have to go first make a feature film. You know, if if I want to get hired to be a director, I have to show them my, you know, indie, either short film or or full length film before I'll ever get that job. And I think it's the same with comics. If you want to get the job in comics, you have to have made a comic first. And there's absolutely nothing stopping anybody from making a comic today so i i I just want to end it there leave it on that sort of positive note that the future is within your hands and and uh and i think it's just the, the space between you and success is time and getting some work done words to live by okay (laughs) And that was Tony Cliff. Uh, yeah. What did you think of that interview, Lee? And he's a, a, a wealth of information and he mm-hmm. knows a lot about it. I, I like that he kind of is, is reiterating some things that I've been saying for the past couple of years that, that you not only have art that you chose to do, but you have a life that goes with it. And, and you know, mm-hmm. he's a perfect example of that. Like how do you balance this stuff out and what you choose to do and how you choose to do it and then a changing landscape over what all this stuff even is. Um, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It was really, it was really, I think he's a a realist too, when it comes to comics, here's a guy who has made, uh, seven or eight graphic novels. Right. And yet he also is like, it's not all sunshine and rainbows doing this. Like you really have to love doing comics to, to make comics. And, uh, especially with uh, his skill level. I mean, he's amazing. I mean, if he's saying that, Shocking. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, though, this is uh, Delilah Dirk is a, it's a swashbuckling, fun adventure. You've got a female protagonist. It's got like all the things, but it also is kind of period piece. And and there is a, a niche for that. There's there's a spot for that. But on the scale of commercial graphic novel projects right now in this time period, you know, when you have Dogman over here, you've got Chainsaw Man over here, and then you've got um, like Reina's sort of introspective life, slice of life kind of comics down here. So that's where like the three, you know, big successful project comic projects in that you would see at a Barnes and Noble. Where does Delilah Dirk fit in that? You know, and it doesn't quite you know, fit in that. If, if you, if you were doing the funny comic stuff like Dogman, your book's going to do great. If you're doing hardcore manga stuff like Chainsaw Man, your book's going to do great. And if you're like, want to tell the story about the, you know, the, the time you went 
you know, you had a medical condition that lasted a year during junior high school, your book's going to do great, you know? Um, and so, uh, and so the fact that he has had success with something that is sort of niche, it's genre, it's like a, a very genre specific is, is, is pretty cool. Um, but I, you know, that just goes to back to this, how do you crack the comics code, you know, start by creating something that, you know, you have two options, create something that, you know, the market wants or create something that you want and hope that you, the market finds it or, or somebody finds it. So anyways, um, we will take us out unless you had anything else you wanted to add there. No, no, no. Just, uh, I mean, one of the things that he just kind of wanted to leave it with that he was saying is just make something, make something, yeah. finish something. And, mm-hmm. uh, can't iterate that enough is make it, right. you know, make, make the thing. That's the thing. And, you know, he talked about, again, like the success that he had uh, optioning Delilah Dirk and, um, getting the, the government funding in Canada for it. None of that would have happened if he wasn't like grinding and making comics. Like no one's going to give you that or option something unless you've like proven that, that you can make it, that you can do it. So I think opportunity comes sort of, you make your own opportunity and it comes from making opportunities for yourself as well. So, yeah. all right. Thanks for joining us. Three point perspectives made possible by svslearn.com. We're becoming a great illustrator starts. Your hosts are normally Will Terry and Lee White and Jake Parker today. Lee White's out on assignment, teaching some people how Wait, to be you an said, illustrator. You said, you said Lee White's out. No, Will's out. I'm, Will's out. But you said Lee. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's been a long morning already. Anyways, uh, yeah, you can find us at willterry.com, leewhiteillustration.com, and mrjakeparker.com. Uh, podcast produced by Daniel Tu. That's danieltu.co. Special thanks to show notes wrangler Lily Howell for just doing a great job doing all those show notes for us. And thank you to our chief operations officer, Lisa Fott, for helping everything else happen behind the scenes that we don't take care of. That's it. Now, go draw something. <laughs>